So, so far we have been uh, speaking about how to get the strategies. Uh, what I would like to do now is uh, to tell you a bit more about how we can represent them so that they actually become useful. And uh, for that I will use a completely different uh, type of learning, namely uh, learning of decision trees. Well, uh, why decision trees? Uh, I will comment on this in a second. Okay, what is a strategy? So we have seen a strategy is a function telling us what kind of decision, uh, what decision to make in each state. So it's a function from states to actions, okay, simplified, okay. For those of you who are used to work with history dependent strategies, then of course uh, you can enrich your uh, state space so that uh, uh, this information about the history is uh, to some extent uh, in there and then you build uh, memoryless strategies over a blown up, uh, blown up state space. Okay, so it's uh, a function from states to actions. What is that mathematically when you output that? Well, it's a long list of uh, pairs, state and action, to be performed. Uh, well, how to make it more readable? Well, first of all, why is this not readable? Well, this long list, I mean, it's a list, so uh, it's not really telling you what is exactly happening, it just tells you what to do in each particular situation, so you cannot make much out of that. And it's a long list, so it's long. So uh, it's too long to be read too long to be understood. So both of it is, uh, is, is, is critical. So what you want to do is to rather choose an encoding that is more sensible in the sense that uh, it reflects the structure of the state space somehow, reflects the ideas that the designer of the system had in mind, and now you tell him how to steer the system so that uh, things work, then the designer wants to relay these decisions to the concepts that he invested into the, into the designing the system. So there are things such as variables in the system and then the decisions depend on maybe whether we are in a state which is uh, dangerous or standard or, or whatever and he doesn't want to get a list of uh, all possibilities what to do in each possible state. And uh, it's also, uh, it's, uh, it's also desirable to make it smaller. So, I mean, small, compact, readable description. That's our, that's our task. So, we had this, uh, this simple example where we had uh, strategies where the list uh, of, all, of all choices is a billion uh, things long, and uh, then we want to make it smaller, so maybe uh, just... Uh, Three are fine, and um, secondly, I uh, would like to encode it somehow. So first of all, what you can definitely do is you can consider uh, decisions happening here in the clouds. And, uh, well, maybe uh, these are unreachable using your strategy, so, I mean, they are obviously useless. Uh, these are reachable, but they are useless because you don't reach the goal, okay? So they have a very low intuitive importance, okay? I haven't defined any importance yet. I will do that later, but this will be just one possibility how to define importance out of infinitely many. It's actually pretty difficult to define something like importance, something that I care about this. Uh, and that's why, uh, that's why we want to use learning to help us with that. We don't even have the means to actually say, I would like to care more about these. Uh, you could easily say, I don't care about states that are not reachable and I don't care about states that cannot reach the goal. Uh, and I drop them, drop them off immediately. Okay, we have seen that uh, this, uh, this can be done. Uh, but what about these states where uh, actually the decisions could matter a bit? Then you could, in principle, compute what is exactly the effect of each particular decision in here or in there. And uh, you could somehow quantify this and uh, then the small, I mean, those states where the importance is very low, then you could drop them and uh, you could invest a lot more computational effort into that to kind of make it a bit smaller. 
Uh, but it would be a lot of work, it wouldn't be efficient, and in the end you wouldn't probably end up uh, with exactly what you want anyway. So uh, we'll see how to actually make uh, use, of uh, use of learning, also not only to do that more efficiently, but also to reflect this quantity that I haven't defined yet, this importance, <clears throat> in a better way than just putting up a threshold. Whatever is more important than this, I want to capture that. Whatever is less important than that, I don't want to capture that. This is actually, it will turn out to be the case, this is actually not what you intuitively want. Although at first glance, it looks reasonable. <laughs> Very good. I don't, I, I don't think it was that much of an achievement, but uh, <laughs> thanks anyway. Uh, So I mean, this is uh, this is definitely an achievement. Uh, so uh, you you have probably heard uh, about uh, decision trees, maybe maybe already during the during the during the school, but uh, more, most importantly, you hear about them uh, all the time in, in in real life. Decision trees have one huge advantage. It's something that uh, almost everyone can understand. If you get your car repaired. What the, what the mechanics uh, people there do is they have a big decision tree telling them what exactly to do. Okay, is the, I mean, connect uh, the computer to the car, step one, right? Try to st start the engine. Does it work? Yes, do this. Does it not work? Do something else. And then you have this kind of branching where in each possible situation you know what the situation is. So, I mean, the car engine doesn't start, but actually the, I mean, the, the gas is in there and the oil is in there, uh, the electricity is working. So, I mean, then you have more and more information deeper and deeper in the tree, and that's something that everyone can kind of understand. As opposed to many other representations that are maybe more efficient in the context of learning, but are not so much understandable. Okay, uh, say, I mean, neural networks, so there has been some recent work on, uh, uh, on interpretability of uh, particular layers. So, I mean, if you're analyzing the pictures, then in particular higher uh, or lower, actually, la layers of, of the network, uh, you can identify things that you intuitively understand under contrast and, and, and things like that. So there has been some progress on trying to understand what is happening there. But, I mean, the understanding of the whole thing is... is, is, is far worse than uh, the understanding that you get when you look at a decision tree and uh, the human mind is, is more um, is, is, is available. Uh, well, the, the, the human mind basically can understand decision trees and not, not uh, the other structures, right? To, to put it very, very, very simply. It's not entirely true, but uh, it's maybe the best that uh, we have at the moment. Okay, that's definitely uh, one of the simplest things, so uh, let's go for that. Okay, so uh, what, what we do here is we want to learn, uh, and we'll see why uh, and how to apply it to the strategies, we want to learn a function based on input-output pairs. So here is an example of a decision tree. So here I, I want to say I want to learn this set. Okay, uh, this is my domain. And uh, this is how I read the tree. So is the number, I mean, let's say that uh, we only have this one variable, x, for capturing, I mean, the, the state space here is very simple. It's just one variable having uh, values. So if it's smaller than three, then uh, it's in the set. If it's not smaller than three, then uh, I am here. Uh, x smaller than seven. Well, if it's not smaller than seven, then it's actually seven, and then I'm in the set. Otherwise, uh, I am unhappy so I'm not in the set, okay? So this is uh, instead of yes and no. Uh, so in principle, uh, this is a tree capturing this, this set. How do you learn it? Well, there, is, uh, there, is, there are algorithms for that and I will not, uh, not discuss them in too much detail. The point is uh, that you give positive and negative uh, examples. So, I mean, one is in the set, three is in the set, seven is in the set, six is not in the set and then maybe you end up with, in the, with this tree, okay? So basically, you can also view it this way, that up, uh, up here you have 
uh, one, three, six, and seven. These are the examples or the, the inputs that you have seen. And now you are actually trying to split them so that you have uh, as uh, uniform, uh, uniform children as possible. So the good ones are in one children, uh, in one child, and the, the, the bad ones are in the, in the other child. So here, what, you, what actually you can do by this is to put one, two, three in here, and they're all good, so you're done. Whereas here you are left with six and seven, and then you still have to split to make it uh, entirely, entirely correct. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is an algorithm based on entropy uh, which actually produces uh, trees. Uh, basically, it tries to look at the current node and think of, oh, what would be a good predicate to split these two so that I have as pure children as possible? So that means one of them is really kind of almost all the good guys and uh, the other is kind of almost all the bad guys. Okay, and there are various uh, techniques for that. And then you build up this tree and at some point you either stop uh, if you're happy with a bit of imprecision uh, or you build the whole thing and then maybe you prune it to make it smaller while introducing some imprecision and, and you can do all sorts of various, various things. One thing to be noticed here is that actually two isn't appearing in the examples. So maybe if I were actually learning this set through these examples, my result would be incorrect because two never happened to be in the, in the data, which can be seen as a disadvantage that I didn't really learn the whole concept. It's actually going to be a huge advantage for us uh, because there will be a lot of things that we don't want to learn, that we don't care about, that using normal data structures, we would have to say something about it. We would have to declare, is two in the set or not? And we have to do something about that. If two is not too important, then we just don't include it into the examples that we learn from. And that's actually an advantage because we don't care about two and we don't have to spend effort on it and uh, make the tree larger or whatever, okay? So this disadvantage will be actually our advantage for, for this particular purpose. Right, so how do I use decision trees to represent strategies? So first of all, I assume, as already discussed in the, in the first part, uh, that my state space has uh, roughly the following structure. It's a bunch of variables, uh, and for simplicity I will only consider integer variables and Boolean variables here. And, I mean, they can be split into different modules or not. I mean, this is not so important. Okay, let's now just, uh, let's now just consider we have a state is given by a valuation of integer variables or, or Boolean variables, okay? Now, uh, what I want to do is I want to take the strategy, which is a list of all the decisions, and I won't want to encode it as a decision tree. So if my strategy is of this form, for every state, I'm getting an action that I should play. Uh, a possible example of a decision tree telling me the information, uh, what I should do, is this one. So, is the variable x smaller than 5? If yes, then play action A. If no, then play action B. Uh, you will probably agree that this is certainly better than the list basically telling you uh, 1A 2a, 3a, 4a, 5b, 6b, etc. Okay? This is capturing the decision not in terms of the state, but in terms of the variable that means something. I mean, the programmer used the variable because the variable actually means something to, to the programmer. So that's why we speak about, I mean, that's why we have the variable here, rather than, uh, rather than, uh, say, a particular bit in a bit representation of the state space, right? I mean, I could play the same game using the BDDs, and I will discuss the differences, uh, the binary decision diagrams, that uh, are pretty well known, I guess, to, to almost everyone here. And, uh, 
one of their disadvantages is that they are working on some bit, crazy bit representation of state space. I mean, this is good for machines. It's not good for us. Okay, we want to speak in terms of the objects that the programmer used while programming the, the system. Okay, so this was uh, a tr an example of a tree for the case where my strategy is of this shape. Okay, for every state I know what to do. It may also be the case that um, I have a type of strategies where I could do this or that. Uh, I mean, I could go with my robot, I could go left or right, both is fine. I shouldn't definitely go backwards because I would fall off the cliff or something, okay? So then, this is something that is uh, a strategy of the form that given a state and an action, it tells me whether it's, a, it's okay to play it or not. <coughs> Sorry. So these strategies are dependent on the context, uh, sometimes called permissive, where any of the choices is fine, or liberal, where uh, it means that uh, you can I mean, uniformize over these decisions, but I mean, you should not omit any, uh, I mean, if you return, then you should uh, maybe uh, try also some others. There are some small, small differences, some differences that I'm not going to talk about. The point is, the type of the strategy is slightly different. And this is actually the type of the, I mean, this is a strategy that gives you more information than the strategy that finally, from this, I mean, from, you compute this, and then finally you can process it to get the upper one, but then you lose information. You lose information about what is also a good option. Okay, you determinize it to get something that is easily implementable, but you lose a lot of information. So that's why I'm going to work more with these, but I mean, you can of course adapt it to, uh, to the simpler case. Okay, so in that case, uh, the decision trees may look a bit different. So in the leaves, there are not actions. I'm not classifying states according to what action should be played. I am actually classifying state action pairs, whether they are good or not. Happy smiley face or, or the sad smiley face. Okay, how does this work? So let's assume for, the, for simplicity that my action space has no structure. I mean, it could have structure and I would do it with, uh, as with the state space, but let's assume that uh, this is just discrete. So I have just names of actions appearing in my, uh, in my, in my model, right? So in the, for instance, the prism, prism language model. How, uh, well, how does that one work? You have synchronizing actions such as, I mean, this one is, this is for some Mars rover arbiter for mutual exclusion uh, protocol. It doesn't really matter too much. Uh, there are some actions that just have a name. So you synchronize, two modules synchronize on one action. Uh, there are also actions that are actually, in the PRISM language, they, are ident they don't have any identifier. It's just a line of code. So if uh, L is greater than zero and B is one, etc. Then what you can do is uh, these are the values of the successors. Okay, so the primed values. I mean, B is set to zero, Z is set to zero, N one is set to minimum of blah blah blah. Okay, so this is actually uh, a pointer to a line number in your program. Okay, so it's pretty complicated, expanded here, but uh, uh, in principle, it's an identifier of what, what should be done. And so that's something that the com uh, programmer can look at uh, when we speak about that. And this tree then is to be interpreted as follows. Uh, is the action that you want to play uh, rec? If yes, that's a very bad idea to do. If no, then is it the, this funny action? If no, then it's fine, then yeah, then you can play it. If yes, then uh, whether to play it or not is really dependent on whether Z is positive or not. Okay, if it's, if it's, uh, if it's positive, uh, then, uh, then it's a good idea to play it, but if it's, if it's not positive, then it's a bad idea to play it. Actually, that's, the Z is capturing uh, uh, this, this mutual, uh, mutual exclusion arbiter, so the Z is capturing somehow how many guys are there uh, trying to get a resource, so if there is nobody, then uh, the behavior is different than if someone got that resource, okay? And actually, I mean, this is a tree that we automatically get um, from this protocol when one injects an error into this, so I mean, this is a pretty long protocol. We injected, or someone actually injected uh, an error into, uh, into one line, particular line, 
which made the protocol not work. And when you looked at the optimizing strategy to figure out what can go wrong, then you get this tree. And this tells you, oh, when there are actually uh, people trying to access the shared thingy, then this action is messing up. This is how you have to play so that you mess up. So this is the line number where you have to fix something. And this was where the error was injected, okay? And it's, it's, uh, it's nice that you get this automatically and you get an explanation sort of of the problem. It's not like, oh, now it doesn't work, and, and so what, okay? And, and trying to prune the system so that, I mean, you have like a minimal system where it's still the error occurs. I mean, here you get a direct an explanation of what, what goes wrong. Okay, so how do we get something like that from a strategy? Uh, and yeah, maybe before I tell you how you do that, maybe the, those of you who are more uh, inclined to, to learning uh, might already ask, oh, do I really want to process the strategy that I compute in this way, or should I really directly compute these decision trees? That would be even cleverer, right? This is harder. This is not solved yet. I mean, there are a couple of groups uh, working on these things, like how to get uh, reliably the strategies uh, in this form so that you get uh, the advantage of learning only small things but already guaranteed. Okay, so this is harder. Uh, so what I can show you at the moment, uh, it's complete form, is how you process the computed strategy into something that is already readable. So how do we do that? So the high-level algorithm works as follows. So first of all, so we have this, I mean, in principle, we have this long list, okay, of uh, state and actions, uh, state action pairs. And uh, if, and sigma is uh, returning, I mean, it's a predicate that's telling me whether SA is uh, true or false, or whether it's good or bad. And what I do, I take good examples uh, from those, I mean, these are the actions that actually I want to play. So these ones, these ones, okay. And then maybe I also have the, I also have the bad ones, okay, where this doesn't hold. So, I mean, these are, uh, I don't want to play here, I want to play there, and so on. Uh, and, this is important, this here is an inclusion. I do not necessarily need to put all the examples there. So, for instance, I don't really care about what is happening in this cloud. So, I don't want to put it intuitively, I don't want to put it into the data that I process. Uh, and uh, secondly, the inclusion buys me one more thing, and that is I don't even have to know the strategy completely. So if I don't know, for some states I don't know what to do there, I just don't put it in the data that I learn, okay? So I can process incomplete strategies as well. It's also fun. Okay, so once I have identified these, and we will see how to do that, we can call a learning algorithm for decision trees to learn from these samples, good and bad examples, and uh, this may or may not be the off-the-shelf tools. And I will show you an example for Markov decision processes where it was basically enough to call what is in Weka or whatever, whatever library you want to use. And then when we wanted to do the same for games, uh, I mean, no stochasticity at all, then actually we had to re-implement a bit different stuff because it was different than what uh, learning tools offer. Once you learn a tree, it may be a wrong one. I mean, it's a product of learning, okay? So, you look at uh, whether it's good or not, and then if it's good enough, then you say, okay, this is the result. And if it's not good enough, so that means it's not capturing enough information so that, for instance, if you play according to that strategy, then you're, then you're losing or you're losing with too high a probability, then <clears throat> you have to do something uh, better about uh, what you learn from. Okay, provide more information, more targeted information. We'll see that. So the crucial point is this. How do you generate what you learn the tree from? 
and uh, yeah, so this is this is the question. Moreover, uh, in this setup, uh, I consider, as usual with the decision trees and, and with, with learning of them uh, anyway, that we are not having a set of inputs, but we are having a multiset. And this is important. If uh, basically it's like. Uh, teaching a child something, right? If you say it once, uh, it does not necessarily have to work immediately, and uh, if you say it 50 times, then uh, there is a higher chance that uh, the learner will reflect it in, in his knowledge uh, than uh, if it's there just once. Okay, so the question is, what should be put there, and uh, in, in, in more detail, how many times we should put it there? Should it be there once, 50 times, or not at all? Uh, now, uh, yeah, so the key, the key uh, idea is, of course, well, the more, an imp uh, the more important the decision is, the more frequently I should put it into the data set, because maybe I really want to capture it. Well, what is importance here? Uh, we said that uh, we definitely want to skip all the data points where we cannot reach the state, or we cannot reach the goal from uh, the state, uh, uh, and then it doesn't really matter what we do, because uh, we anyway don't do anything useful. So uh, we define here one possible uh, definition out of myriads of, of, of possibilities of an importance of a decision in a particular state. So I define an importance of a state with respect to a goal and a strategy or controller here. So, I mean, I could start with this probability of uh, reaching this uh, state under the strategy. So if I go there under that strategy often, then probably it's, uh, it's kind of an important state and I should really know what to do there because I'm going to face this problem again and again. And uh, this is not reflecting at all yet uh, the possibility that I go frequently to somewhere, I mean, I could come frequently over here, well, it's half a percent in this picture, but uh, it could be a lot more, but no matter what I do here, I'm anyway never going to get to, uh, to the target state. Okay, so uh, I only take those runs where I reach the goal, uh, so sorry, those, those uh, events where I reach S, if I can also reach the goal. So I take this uh, conditional probability, which is uh, one way to view this. You could take, for instance, just the first part, or you could take the expected number of times you visit S on the way to goal. So the more you are there, I mean, maybe you just don't pass through, maybe you have to come there five times and then you really should know what you're doing, and so on. So you have like many different possibilities, and this is one way to try out things. I mean, it's like in, in uh, um, most of the learning approaches. You try out and see, and then you tweak the parameters, and maybe it works better, and then you tweak a bit more, and then yet better, and maybe you have to come up with a completely different approach. Uh, the important thing is, for correctness, this is not important at all. You can come up with anything. It may be more or less efficient, but it will always work in the sense that you will produce a result that is uh, correct and then that is, that is reliable, it just may not be uh, that nice or that understandable, that readable, for instance. So how do you, how do you, uh, how do you deal with that? So this is actually even a more complicated question than the one that we set off uh, at the beginning. So we asked what is the probability to get from in it uh, to the goal state, from the initial state to the goal state, and uh, here we are asking for each state, what is the probability, and even conditioned on something else. I mean, it's even more complicated. So I, def I, I don't have this information. So how do I go about that? I don't use the, exactly this information. Anyway, I, I took this formula just because I had a feeling like it could be useful. I mean, maybe it's not, right? So I can take something that is just an approximation of this. So what I can do, is I can approximate it from experience. So I can take, uh, I can run simulations, and uh, I am going to record the number of those that visit the state and the goal 
And if I divide it by the number of simulation visiting the goal, then I get an approximation, experimental approximation of this formula. Okay, so what I'm going to do is when I'm generating good and bad and I run a simulation, I collect all the states that appear there. If it's a successful one, I reach the goal, I collect all the states that are there and I, I throw them into, uh, into, the, into, the, uh, into the data set. And for each of these states, I learn which actions are okay, which are good, which are bad. So I put them into bad and good sets or multisets. And this way I generate, uh, generate uh, the, the data. And it's done through the simulations very efficiently, not very precisely, uh, but anyway we're approximating something that is maybe a complete nonsense, uh, so it doesn't matter. But it should be somehow intuitively capturing why this could be important. Okay, you can come up with something else if you like, but um, uh, this doesn't really matter too much. Okay, once you have the, once you have the data here, then, uh, and the strategy, uh, if the strategy in the end is good enough, then uh, that's fine. If it's not, then you have to refine. So what you do is, well, you can do a lot of things. It may mean that you didn't have enough data, so maybe you run a few more simulations. This may give you information about other states that you haven't visited before that, or it may just tell you, oh, uh, these are states that you have already visited, you have it in your data set, but let's put it there once more because we really want to learn these. These are really important. We are visiting them all the time. Or you could be saying, uh, well, I detect places where I'm screwing up using other techniques and I just put this data in there. You can just do whatever you wish. It's just that you should, uh, you should allow for, in the limit, for more data and uh, if you also will, then uh, for more precise trees capturing the data. So that means larger tree has more precision. Of course, this is what you want, more precision, but of course, the larger the tree, the less readable it is. So this is a trade-off. To give you an example of uh, what you can get on, uh, on the benchmarks that you have seen previously. So these are, I mean, these are with... Uh, so some of the benchmarks, and now the, the numbers are slightly different because the, 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 the parameters are, are different of these models, uh, because it's actually when you, we want, to, when you want to compare it with traditional verification techniques, then for things that were as large as, as there, you cannot even reasonably work with the output. So the tools cannot even output the strategy because it's so large. So they give you a number, but and they can internally maybe work with the strategy, but you cannot even output it for, for various technical reasons. Because it's just too large of an object to, to work with. You see the uh, probabilities are, are, are different, uh, you know, different uh, orders. Now, uh, what you can do, uh, what you would normally do is, you first drop all the states that are not reachable under that strategy. So you see that actually saves you already quite a, quite a portion of states. So instead of 90,000 states uh, here, you only have 60,000 reachable, so it's a lot smaller thing. But still, it's a too long list to uh, make any sense out of it. You could say, okay, I take this and I process it into a BDD. So there's a binary decision diagram. So how many of you know what a binary decision diagram is? They are the wrong, wrong question. How many don't? Okay. Uh, so, uh, a binary decision diagram looks a bit like a decision tree, but it's actually working over not... Uh, so, the state here would not be a collection of values for variables, it would just be a bit string, a long bit string, and then you can ask, is the seventh bit in the representation of this string zero or one? And if yes, then you go uh, left, and if no, then you go right, and so on and so forth. Moreover, uh, there is a fixed order of these bits that you can ask for. So maybe your order is first I ask for the seventh bit, then in the second level I always ask for the third bit, and then for the seventeenth bit. And you can play with the ordering, but it's actually uh, quite expensive to figure out what is a good ordering. And uh, well, anyway, you can uh, you can apply this structure that is very, I mean, very usable for many verification purposes for compactly representing huge sets. Uh, because, I mean, it's a classifier, so it's uh, representing a subset of, of the domain. And then what you get uh, is, well, I mean, considerably smaller, considerably smaller object. 
I mean, it has its graph with 4,000 nodes instead of a list of half a million items. If you actually play the same with decision trees, you get something that actually, as a picture, can fit on a piece of paper, right? Although it's uh, describing what a system with millions of states, uh, or at least hundreds, or tens of thousands of states uh, can do. Uh, so, I mean, you can get like, a, say, 27 uh, state, uh, 27 node uh, tree with a relative error of 1%. Okay, so these are, uh, these are those that, uh, the, the numbers are for those trees that already have uh, precision uh, at most one, uh, imprecision at most 1%. What do I mean by that? That if the original probability to reach the goal was 1%, then now this is one, you get a, a tree with 1% plus minus 10 to minus 4. Okay, so it's, uh, it's, it's a relative error of, of the resulting strategy. Now, okay, what is this funny one? Well, actually, in that setup, uh, you can do whatever and you'll almost surely reach the goal. Well, but it's good to know that, right? That you actually don't have to implement a complicated strategy and no matter what you do, you just uh, get that, okay? And this is what, what, the, what the verification tools don't even realize. Uh, okay, but anyway, you're getting, you're getting small things. Now, what is this funny memo out here? Well, if you try to get a strategy out of this, system with this that many states then you don't succeed i mean you cannot even get the strategy for such a small system from the standard tool so what you actually have to do is you have to run the technique that we talked about an hour ago where you produce you visit only a small fraction of the state space you produce a controller uh, that is defined only for a small fraction of the state space only a, like what is that a thousandth of a, of the state space there, it's defined, it has precision 10 to minus 6, say, and then you can encode it as a BDD or as a decision tree, so actually you can uh, draw a small picture representing what is happening in this uh, 1 million state system with a relative error that is, yeah, well, close to negligible. And actually you can scale it up to uh, even, even uh, so I mean, you can scale up this model to, I mean, to trillions and it will still work. So it's something that the model doesn't even fit in the memory. You never look at the whole model. You can still produce actually a small picture representing what to do in that model uh, with, with very high precision. And you know the, the degree of the imprecision. All right. Uh, I have been talking about BDD and uh, decision trees. Why, is, why are decision trees here so much better than, uh, than BDDs? What are the reasons? Why do we have to actually go for something that is in the learning community and we don't, I mean, in verification, we, we don't have that. We use BDDs and we're we are happy about them. So there are a couple of, couple of differences. So one, some of the differences are directly on the level of the data structure. So what are actually the differences between the data structures? So uh, a disadvantage of decision trees versus uh, binary decision diagrams is that trees are trees. So we are uh, not having direct acyclic graphs, but we're just having trees. We're not merging identical subgraphs. Okay? In BDDs, you merge whatever is isomorphic, you merge that and you get something a lot smaller. This is essential. It makes it uh, very compact. Here, not only it's not dharma, you could in principle consider doing that, you wouldn't save much. One of the reasons is that the, uh, the subtrees are always a bit different. Why? Well, this is actually an advantage of the decision trees, that the subtrees can be different in the sense that uh, you can have a tree where you ask here, is x greater than seven? And if yes, then uh, you ask, is y smaller than 3? And if no, then you ask, is z greater than 5? You ask different questions depending on what the result of the previous uh, information search was. I mean, if the engine cannot, st uh, cannot start, then it's probably not uh, really important to ask, if the engine is running, is there any strange noise going on? Well, I mean, it doesn't even start, right? So why would you ask that? In binary decision diagrams, you have the fixed ordering of what to ask when. Sometimes you can skip 
some of these, uh, some of these uh, questions, but you cannot reverse the order. And with the skipping, I will comment on that later. And reversing the, uh, I mean, uh, changing the order and, and choosing different predicates on the same level, which is not allowed in BDDs, uh, is very helpful to get smaller trees. Of course, then if you're ch changing, um, if you have different, uh, if the trees are different, I'm using asking different questions, then you cannot really merge the uh, identical subgraphs because there are almost none. That was a question. But, um, but you use the BDD only for the compact representation, that, that's one part, but uh, the important property is that, that canonical, so that you can compare the unicity, but in your case, you don't need that. Mm -hmm. So in some sort of way, it's overkill for the problem. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good comment, yeah. True. So uh, we have, and I can relate it to that, we have uh, differences on the level not of the data structure itself, but on the way we use the data structure. So actually that is the difference between learning and sort of just storing in a data structure. So, uh, what are the advantages of actually learning here? So, first of all, uh, for the BDDs, we are using the bit representation, which is something that is not understandable, so we don't want to use that. And it's actually not what is going to be efficient or the most efficient uh, thing to ask. Because the, typically, the program works on the level of... Uh, of uh, variables with integral values. So if x is greater than five, then something, or if x is even, then something. If you ask for bit values, then you have to ask quite a few questions before you figure out that the boundary is five and uh, that it's even or odd, right? You have to, I mean, well, even or odd is easy in binary, but it's divisible by three, then I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it starts to get complicated. So the possibility to have a wider class of predicates that you choose from and that you pick by some heuristic, it's very expensive to choose the best one. BD, uh, BDDs choose the, I mean, the one that is prescribed by the ordering and then just choose the ordering. Here, you, it's also all about the choice of the predicates. So you may try to synthesize the predicates, learn if there is a good predicate kind of splitting your children into, uh, splitting your uh, data into pure children as much as possible. Uh, a good predicate is also a readable one, so you can try to synthesize among those that you declare nice, readable, simple, or whatever. Okay, so there, there you have more flexibility. Secondly, uh, you have this more efficient way of producing this data structure. Instead of figuring out which is the right variable ordering, where, I mean, this problem is NP-complete, uh, of course, then you have some heuristics uh, which try to swap the ordering, but, I mean, if you ever try that, it's really hard and it doesn't help too much. Uh, well, I mean, too much means, I mean, it can help in orders of magnitude, but it, I mean, it's like, you would expect that you could do even a lot better. It's really hard to figure that out. Here you have these, uh, f well, fancy uh, entropy-based heuristics uh, based on uh, what I currently think is the most efficient way, not really caring about the global optimality, but I mean, trying really to go uh, for what, what, looks, what looks reasonably now. And even more importantly, uh, you have uh, the don't care inputs. So as I had in the example before, uh, the example with the set uh, one, two, three, six, uh, well, sorry, one, two, three, seven was that. Depending on whether two is there or not, then the tree uh, would look like this or like something else. If I don't care about two, then I will produce the simplest tree, or kind of the simplest tree, that captures one, three, and, and, and seven, and I don't really care about two. Maybe it will say that two is in there, maybe it will say that two is not in there. But I don't care about two. So let me just use the smaller of the two possibilities, and uh, this will result a small, into a small tree. If I'm using a BDD, I actually have to say what I put into the data structure. I mean, this is this, rigid view of data structures. I have data, I put it into the data structure and I expect the data is there. Right? I mean, this is maybe the definition of a data structure. 
we are actually taking the data, putting them into the data, I mean, we're taking part of the data, we're putting them into the data structure, so we definitely don't have the complete data there, and even the stuff that we put there is wrong, okay? So this is uh, giving us more flexibility. So this is uh, also the last, uh, last advantage. It's actually imprecise. The fact that if I say you should do this and you should not do that, and then the learner gets it wrong, just because it's much simpler to learn it in a slightly different way, which is screwing up that particular decision, allows me to have much smaller decision tree that maybe is not capturing this very corner case, but maybe if that corner case is very negligible, then I can forget about that. And if it's important, then I will figure that out and I will put it more times there and I will make the learner learn it, right? So it's, it's like uh, when you're, again, when you're teaching a child something, then uh, you're not explicitly listing all the corner cases, right? I mean, you, you first start with like, uh, like, don't touch the socket and only later on you, you say like, okay, well, uh, sometimes we have to, I mean, uh, touch the socket if you want to repair it, but then I mean, you have to switch off the, switch off the electricity and I mean, you, you add more refined stuff later. Okay, but you start with the, with, the, with the coarse stuff and this gives you a very simply learnable uh, set and uh, therefore also the result is, is more readable and more understandable. So it's these, uh, it's also these uh, sort of disadvantages or something that one could view as a disadvantage. It's imprecise. Uh, and it's not really capturing, I mean, it's, 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 it's only a partial uh, model for your data. These are actually advantages in this context. Right, so this is, uh, we have been speaking about uh, the setup of Markov decision processes. Now let's go for something, uh, let's go for something different, namely for games. So no probabilities now. Uh, so let's play a game of uh, chess or, or uh, Go or, or whatever. Then in that case, I mean, these uh, techniques, I mean, learning techniques generally uh, can offer a lot more than precise techniques. Okay, so everyone knows that, okay, we can beat the world champion in Go by, by computer now. Okay, but it's going to beat him maybe, maybe even now, like thousand uh, times out of uh, thousand and one or whatever. But he's not going to win always. This is something that in the setup of a game, we are not happy about, right? So if you have, if you want to, uh, so games arise, for instance, in the case of synthesis, you want to synthesize uh, a system that works always. So you're interested in the worst case. So if there is a game that I will lose, then I don't have a good enough player. I mean, the, the, the AlphaGo is not good enough because it doesn't win always. It's good enough for practical purposes of playing with other humans, but I mean, if you want to, uh, if you want to make sure that no matter what kind of behavior happens on the, in, in the street that uh, you're not doing something wrong, then, I mean, you have to take care, uh, take care of all the possibilities. Hmm? Well, uh, then you have to take a bit different philosophy than actually learning does because, uh, uh, learning is not made, is not tailored to capture all corner cases and uh, be precise. So you actually are interested in overfitting the, so you are constructing maybe a decision tree for the strategy, but you really want to overfit your data. You don't want to generalize in any way, maybe. You have the strategy already, I mean, right? You don't need to induce what would you do in states that do not even exist. You only want to capture what you already have. So you really want to overfit, something that you definitely don't want to do in, in, in the learning area. So we are kind of misusing or even abusing uh, decision trees for our purposes uh, in a way that is never meant, was never meant to be, uh, in the way they were never meant to be used. So, uh, So we really have to overfit, that, that means, first of all, uh, when you get the tree and you use the standard libraries, uh, the standard libraries at some point refuse to unfold the tree anymore because they tell you, oh, this is precise enough, come on, you never, you never want to have something that is more precise. And uh, 
because in reality, this is what they are used for. Okay, so even if you just want to uh, uh, want to unfold you, you unfold a, a non-pure child into a pure children, then you don't have the option because the tools don't allow you. So you have to do it yourself. Moreover, there are also more fundamental issues. At some point, it may be the case that the entropy heuristic tells you, well, no matter what you do, you're not going to improve. I mean, you can split on that predicate, on that predicate. You're not going to get more information. Why? Well, actually, maybe you need to get two predicates to actually figure out more information. For instance, if uh, it's about equivalence, if x is equal y, I mean, it's, uh, if uh, you can only ask about x and y, and not about x xor y or x equivalent y, then you actually have to have two queries. And it, if you ask just about x, is x 0 or 1, or is y 0 or 1, you're not getting more information. You have to ask two things. At that moment, again, the tools will say, well, we're not getting any information gain when, uh, when we're unfolding uh, using any of the predicates. We'll just stop here. Okay? So you have to actually uh, take the tools and, uh, and change them because you are using them in a way they were never meant to be used. Uh, so then you have to kind of make, uh, make some sort of look ahead, like, okay, if I use more, uh, more predicates, what happens, and so on. Uh, okay. But you can do that, and uh, you can still get something that is better than, uh, than BDDs. So here is, uh, this is some, from some collection of benchmarks from the synthesis competition uh, collection. So this is, this is the, this is the diagonal here. So this is the, these are sizes for trees and for BDDs. So you see they are better. It's not like by orders of magnitude. So this is like 10 times, what is that? This, is, this should be something like uh, 10 times smaller or something, okay? So it's, uh, it's not so great an achievement compared to the MDPs. Why is that? Well, because we have to actually fit every possible corner case in here. And that is costly. Well, it still is better than the BDD, but uh, uh, it's, of course, more costly. And, uh, yeah, then what, what, what can you do? Well, you can do a, a lot of things. You can say, so, I mean, this, this is actually also why it's not so good, is that uh, it's uh, for this uh, synthesis competition where the, the tasks are very low-level defined. This is basically like hardware circuits, okay? So you basically have input and output signals, Boolean input and output signals, and then you have a, then you have a, a requirement on what uh, the output signals should do uh, corresponding to the input signals. So you, your structure is very poor. It's a lot of Booleans and you have no idea what they mean, right? If you work with actual integers, you could do a lot more. So I mean, you start with a poor representation, so you get poorer results. Uh, and uh, Secondly, then, if you have only these booleans, then, of course, you're also on the level of BDDs because you only ask, is this zero or one? So you don't work with the integer, so you don't have this fancy possibility of using the integral predicates. Okay, so this is, again, uh, then in that respect, then you're losing. So you should, I mean, uh, transform your benchmark into something that has the structure and not really uh, have it in the, in the, in the boolean, uh, boolean way written down. And so you can, in, even in this case, you can think of, okay, maybe I should then be using clever predicates that are still sort of just on Booleans. So very often what happens is that uh, you get this pattern, a simple pattern. Uh, if this goes wrong, or this goes wrong, or this goes wrong, or this goes wrong, then do this, otherwise do something else. So it's like a big disjunction of, uh, of, uh, of the Booleans. And then if you add this as a predicate that you can also use in your decision tree, they allow you to use these more complicated predicates, assuming that they are still readable enough. And this junction of, of Booleans is maybe still considered reasonably readable. So already then you get something that is like half the size. So this is this is uh, this uh, this is this table. You get uh, trees of half the size just because you eliminated this simple pattern that appears and it's hopefully still readable and it's, it's, it's much smaller. So then, of course, if you have wrongly, or not wrongly, but uh, somehow 
problem posed in a, in a very naive way without the structure, so you kind of transform it into something that is just like bit string representation of these things. You can still work with that, but of course it's harder. So that's, that's the message of this. And of course it's harder to work with uh, uh, the setup of games where you have to cover every corner case compared to uh, probabilistic systems. But still you can do that. Uh, and I mean, this is some example of uh, washing machines that uh, run in parallel, and I mean, it's not so important. A couple of input and output signals, size of the state space here. Uh, you train on some samples, and then you build the BDDs, and they are of some size. The decision trees are considerably smaller. And if you allow, uh, if you in this particular case, if you allow also this junction, then you get like trivial trees where just, I mean, it's basically one decision. Like, if any of these guys is doing something wrong, do this. Otherwise, just do the default behavior, right? And only to capture such a simple instruction, you actually don't see that in the BDD. You, you, you don't get that information, okay? So we're not doing anything actually fancy. It's just that the verification techniques were that lame before, right? So another uh, useful or possible use of this, uh, of this uh, strategy representation is that maybe you want to get a parametric solution for a problem of, I mean, maybe you have a communication protocol or maybe these washing machines, many of them in parallel. And then you have to have someone who kind of centrally decides what to do. And then the solution can differ depending on whether you have five machines, six machines, seven machines. And you really would like to synthesize a control that works always. Okay, for whatever number of machines. And then this is, uh, I mean, in general, undecidable. Um, depends on, on the model. But uh, even if you can decide something, then uh, I mean, typically, uh, typically it's very hard. What you can do here is you can take a model with four of these machines, a small one. You build a decision tree and you get this. Let's look at this. So uh, this is always a question on the, on the Boolean uh, variable. This, where there are more of them, this is the big disjunction. So if any of them is, uh, I mean, if, if uh, any of them is, uh, is one, then you go in one direction. If, uh, if in the other way, uh, in the other case, you go in the other, other direction. Now, if you look at carefully at this tree, it's a complicated thing uh, for, uh, and I can tell you this is for the setup where you have seven, uh, what was that, machines or clients or whatever. And you see that there are a couple of things such as uh, empty zero here, empty one here, empty one here, empty one here, a fill one here. And then uh, there is some requirement six, requirement six, requirement seven, requirement seven, six, six, okay. And uh, six here, okay. So actually, there is nothing interesting happening with the clients two, three, four, five. It's all about like communication of two clients. So what you can actually do is uh, try out this in the general setup where you have more of those clients. Or <clears throat> if you think that uh, it's important that it's six and seven, if you have seven clients, then maybe if you have 10 clients, then the first thing to be tried out is what if I replace seven uh, with 10 and six with nine? Okay, will it work? Okay, and uh, so you get at least suggestions and uh, you can actually uh, take this and you can apply it to the parametrized system and then check whether that one is actually working and then uh, the, the task is much simpler if you already have a good suggestion how it could work. So <clears throat> it could help in unexpected ways, not just represent strategies but actually solve parametrized verification problems. Uh, yeah, this one is to uh, actually show you that it really depends, as often it is the case in, uh, in machine learning, on the way uh, you represent the data. So we have complex things such as maybe you have a synthesis problem for an LTL formula. So you have a linear time temporal property that you want to satisfy and then uh, you create a system, uh, you create a game out of that, you want to solve the game and, and represent the result and all this. These are complex objects. These are not Booleans. I mean, these are formulae of logics and uh, very complicated objects. 
And then depending on how you represent them as vectors, I mean, you have to represent it as, as vectors of, say, integers or booleans or something that, that the learning algorithms can work with. And of course, it's also up to you to represent it uh, somehow carefully. And this is just to show that uh, if you choose an extremely naive representation for uh, extremely naive representation, then you're still a bit better than BDDs, okay? Uh, but if you actually do just a tiny, tiny bit more work, just look at what this, current, this actually should be. You don't represent it as an ID of uh, like some formula, but you actually look at, oh, this formula is a big disjunction of something. Then already with, with, uh, with this, you can, I mean, uh, again, save another, I mean, it can be, again, twice as small. And then you can, I mean, uh, you can always work more on trying to represent your data so that it fits, uh, the representation fits more the, the actual purpose. So this is also important part that, that uh, one knows from learning and one doesn't know from verification. How you represent it is, is, is very, very critical. Okay, so let me summarize uh, this strategy representation. So there is, again, this interleaving of, uh, uh, I get the precise uh, decisions from, uh, from the verification part, and then I suggest the decision tree. Uh, so, I mean, there is this, what is important, and, uh, and how do I create the tree, and then I get the tree, and then I see, oh, it's wrong one. So where it's wrong, what kind of further information I need, and then you kind of exchange this until you get something that you're happy with. Uh, and, uh, yeah, the point here was that uh, you don't want to just say in this traditional verification uh, philosophy, uh, the usual way, that uh, something is relevant or not. I can drop it or not. But you have this quantity of, like, how important things are. This, some, this thing that is so hard to express. And that's why we, that's why we need the learner to make... Uh, make some sense out of this intuition. And, uh, yeah, okay. So there is uh, some literature on this in the slides on, on the topics that, uh, that I have covered so far for different models and different uh, objectives. <clears throat> so you have it in the slides that should be now accessible uh, or yeah, so uh, let me just skip this. And let me, let me go through a few more examples that illustrate uh, this concept of how to combine learning and verification. Many of them are go following the similar path. Uh, some of them are following a different path. So let me, let me comment more on this. So... Um, I will look at uh, uh, reinforcement learning, decision training learning, also automata learning a bit. Uh, all of those you have, uh, you have already seen and uh, for different uh, purposes. And uh, uh, let's start with uh, reinforcement learning and verification. So this is, let me focus on uh, some other approaches to the problem that we discussed in the, in the first part of the lecture. So, for instance, this, this paper, also one of the older ones, or oldest ones on, on this topic, um, is uh, considering MDPs where on top of our MDPs, you also have some sort of time and some sort of prices, okay? So rewards, you can think of rewards, and time is just, uh, well, let's, let's just imagine discrete... Uh, uh, or let's imagine, uh, let's imagine clocks from, from time to automata if you know what that is, and if you don't, then uh, let's just uh, assume that uh, I mean, the time is continuous, but interesting things uh, happen in a sort of discrete way. Now, uh, what they want to do here is they want to combine things. And uh, I also got that question during the, the, the break, and I will comment on this even more. Uh, maybe we want to combine some sort of safe behavior. So my robot is doing something that I definitely, I mean, it's, it's not hurting anyone, it's not getting damaged and all that. And on the top of that, I want this to behave energy aware or whatever, okay? So I want to consider the worst case. 
So what they do is time bound, I mean, but there is some worst case consideration, and then there is some sort of optimization. So uh, in the sense that, okay, I want to minimize the expected cost, but if I actually don't succeed entirely, maybe I don't mind. Okay, so this is somehow bordering uh, with verification, I mean, on the border of verification, because I'm suggesting controller that is then maybe not the cheapest one. Okay, and I don't even have any guarantee that it's close to the cheapest one. Okay, and then, and then it's up to you whether you like it or not. Uh, there are also techniques that uh, guarantee you this, uh, but then they are, of course, slightly less efficient than those that, uh, where the guarantee is, is not there, and uh, you have to work more to get the guarantees. So this was one of the early works where they uh, do the following. Uh, they take a sort of strategy iteration approach, I would say. So you take... Uh, strategy, arbitrary strategy, say a uniform at the beginning, you simulate the strategy on your system, and now this gives you uh, different runs for different decisions, because it was uniform, meaning that it was randomly deciding uh, between all the actions. Now, some of the runs were really good, like that means uh, quick, you quickly got on time where you wanted to be, and it was cheap, and some of those were bad, okay? Either incorrect or very expensive. Uh, and then what you do is you look at the best runs. So you've got the data. Now you take the data and try to get another strategy, improve your original strategy based on this data and get another strategy out of that. That is generating more of these good runs. And how you do that? Well, then, I mean, there is a bunch of ways how to do that. Uh, I mean, you can use, I mean, they, they use some logistic regression, uh, covariance uh, approaches. I mean, they, they also build trees for the, for the strategy to kind of generalize it and try to uh, generalize the runs into a strategy and, and, and see how, it's good, how, well it's, how well it's doing. And then what you do is uh, you repeat this again and again and again, and when you run out of your time budget, then you just say, okay, this is what I came up with. And here you have a guarantee that, I mean, it's safe because you uh, always chose only a strategy that uh, does the safe stuff, maybe. Uh, so the, I mean, after several iterations, you get that. Uh, but maybe you're not, uh, you're not uh, cheap. Uh, uh, in the end, in the limit, of course, you're converging, you don't know how far you are, so maybe this is a bit unsatisfactory. So maybe one can, one can uh, also do other things. So uh, there are other works such as, uh, such as this one, where the safety is really guaranteed. Uh, so uh, what, is, what are they aiming for? They have, it's called safety constraint reinforcement learning, meaning that you have a hard constraint for the safety of your system. You never want to do this or that. And uh, so what the naive way how to approach this is, well, take your system, analyze what are the bad actions that you never really want to take because you would commit to a, something that results in a disaster later. So you just pre-compute this, and on the rest, you run reinforcement learning. Okay, so this is the cheapest way how to combine verification and learning. You run verification in part of it, and you learn learning on the rest. And uh, yeah, well, then you again have guarantee that it's safe, and you have, uh, I mean, in the limit, maybe you're getting uh, uh, optimal, optimal rewards. Uh, but maybe you don't even know how, uh, how close you are to the optimum, so it's still uh, not so good. Then there is uh, a very similar work to the one that, uh, that we've seen in the, in the first part of the, of, the, of the lecture, where basically this is, uh, what they're doing is they're not, doing, uh, they're not analyzing reachability in market decision processes, but more complicated properties that uh, you can encode uh, with uh, certain types of automata, and I'm not going to go into that. Uh, but uh, so they are doing it uh, in a slightly more on the fly fashion than uh, what one would uh, have to pre compute uh, with, with, the, with the older approach. So, I mean, making things more on the fly is, of course, something that pays off. So, this is something that, uh, that, you, try to, uh, that you try to do. Uh, there, is, there are also uh, recent works on uh, how to combine, uh, again, rewards 
with, uh, but not only safety, but maybe all generally Omega regular objectives. There you can really pre-compute and then run reinforcement learning on the rest, because there is no simple representation of what is the pre-computed state space with the safe actions. Uh, it's more complicated than that. And uh, so you don't have, uh, I mean, for those of you who know that, then you don't have uh, any most permissive strategy and then you have to do, uh, then you have to combine interleaf the learning and the playing safe, sort of. And uh, so, but you can also do that and get the guarantees. Uh, you can also apply Monte Carlo techniques. Uh, these are, I mean, fancy because of AlphaGo and you can, and this also buys you something. Uh, then there is a lot of, a uh, lot of, uh, work on entirely different problems than, uh, than those I have discussed. Sorry. Uh, uh, namely, the application or well, what people are doing with, uh, with programs, okay? Normal programs that we program, so I mean, nothing fancy, no, no probabilities, no synthesis of controllers, just verification of programs. Then you want to say that, okay, there is, uh, I mean, this program terminates or uh, there is never division by zero and, and so on. Then for that, often you need, for the analysis, you need to generate invariants invariance of cycles, okay? So this is yeah, I mean, known to be hard to come up with, with, with invariance somehow automatically. And then this is a very good place where we can apply learning. What we can do is we can generate any nonsense and then check whether it's an invariant or not. Checking is easy. Getting good suggestions is hard. And this is what learning is good at. So again, we wrap it into this safety envelope of, well, you get me or you give me your suggestions, I process them, I see if there is any sense in it, and then if it is, then I will output that, and if not, then I will give you some more feedback and, uh, and you will improve your suggestion. So here, for instance, what you can do is you can run runs of, of the cycles and see what are the relationships between the variables, how they are changing, how they are not changing, and come up with a suggestion for an invariant. Once you have the suggestion for an invariant, you check whether it's an invariant or not. This is easy, or it depends on how complicated the invariant is, but I mean, reasonably easy. And if not, uh, then you actually, uh, you want to refine. So maybe you want to, uh, you just don't want to give, get more runs and then try once again. You want to give some information back. So what was the problem? So this variable was, was wrong, so maybe then I really want to focus on that one and, and try to run a few runs with different values for this particular variable to see how it behaves and so on. Um, right, so you also know about uh, automata learning, so let me, let me show you uh, two, uh, two examples of usage of automata learning. So one of them is for representing strategies. So you can represent a strategy not only by a decision tree, but of course by, well, whatever you wish. Uh, some people think it might be a good idea to represent them using an automaton. It's a traditional way of doing that in verification because it's very convenient computationally. Probably it's not very useful for understandability or only to some extent, uh, but it's definitely, it's worth, uh, representing strategies this way because you can then actually learn maybe directly the automata, so learn small representation of the strategies, compact ones, and actually that will help you also to generalize uh, your learned knowledge about part of the system and maybe you will actually capture the whole strategy very soon because you know, already know something about parts of the system and uh, you say, oh, well, if X is positive, maybe in these cases I was always, I should always pick A. And then you haven't seen many of other states where X is also positive. And you try playing A there and it actually works. Oh, very good. You came up with a winning strategy uh, much, uh, much uh, sooner than if you had to actually examine the, the rest of the state space in detail. So... Uh, you may try to uh, learn automata from, uh, from the runs and, and, and see if, uh, if they generalize well. You may also learn automata of systems that you may even know. Maybe you even have a white box system that you even know the code. 
but you don't really have a good model of the system, you have just the code. So you run the system, you run a lot of, uh, a lot of runs, you uh, have some intuition that, I mean, these uh, things are important, so maybe these are some high-level communication things and uh, some other things are like low-level computation within the module, so you ignore those. So you learn a model on a particular level of uh, abstraction that you, you're interested in, and then you can take this model and you can verify that model against your property that maybe some communication protocol never gets stuck or whatever. People have been doing that very successfully. This doesn't give you the guarantee that the system is working. Actually, very often you can, dis you can find bugs based on the learned small model and then you can check the model and you can find the bugs easily. And you find them in an abstract way, so it's easy to kind of correct them because, you know, that was the problem. It's not like that here you get one obscure trace and you don't know what is happening, but you get uh, a trace in this abstract model and you see, oh, there is a bug in here and it translates to real bugs and then, uh, I mean, there have been quite a few, uh, quite a few experiments with this and uh, usually it's pretty successful. And one is quite surprised how many, I mean, for instance, like TCP implementations that are on the market uh, they're all buggy. Uh, I mean, there is like a manual that thick with all the requirements, what must, should, and can happen in the protocol, and what should not, and uh, must not, and then, then all these kind of requirements. And then it's really hard to actually figure out what the requirements are, and that's also maybe one of the reasons why the protocols are, are often wrong. And also, I mean, it's, it's a hard task, right? So uh, it's not so surprising that they are wrong, even the commercial things. And this way you can learn the behavior from observing that, check the model and see, oh, it's wrong here and there, and uh, it's good for bug finding. Okay, you don't get any guarantees that the actual model is correct, because you just learn the model from, the, from what you've seen, but uh, still, still useful. And uh, I also want to uh, stress uh, uh, one... one uh, application, uh, one or two applications of uh, learning approaches where it really doesn't matter if it actually produces any reasonable result. It can be complete nonsense most of the time uh, because you don't really care about correctness here at all. Uh, and that is, for instance, for theorem provers. Well, uh, for theorem provers, you definitely care about correctness. And this is, they are taking care of that. And when they prove something, you have the proof. The trouble is, which way to go so that the proof is constructed? Should I try this? Should I try this rule or that rule? Should I try this hypothesis? I mean, this lemma or that lemma? This is hard. And then, for guidance, learning is perfect. You get some sort of experience from past examples. You get some suggestions. You have some sort of feelings. You get whatever vague thing, wrong thing from, from, from learning. And this gives you some guidance. Try this first. And maybe this will lead to a useful lemma. Uh, maybe it will not lead to a useful lemma, but it will lead to a lemma. You will always produce a correct result because the, it's wrapped in the theorem prover. Okay? It's just that the search, uh, the search in the, uh, the space of all possibilities of the proofs is guided somehow by something that has a chance to succeed better than, than doing it randomly. Uh, or, uh, I mean, there is also a meta usage of, uh, of all this. So, I mean, maybe you have uh, your model checker that already uses learning, and then uh, you have plenty of those, and you have different benchmarks, and then you can see it in the competition. Some tools are kind of better for some benchmarks, and some are better from other, for other benchmarks. Sometimes it's easy to see that, right? Some, some tools cannot cope well with concurrency, okay? So you know that. Sometimes it's just like, I mean, what the hell is the difference between these two programs? Why does it work here and why does it not work here? And you have no idea. And then you learn it. So you say you learn control flow graphs or whatever, you classify it. Maybe you don't even have uh, an explanation why it is the case, but you have a suggestion, well, you should use that tool. And then of usually, I mean, this is not so surprising, once you learn it, uh, then, uh, I mean, on, say, half of the, half of the, the samples, and then uh, you, you get this meta model checker that just first analyzes the task, picks the right model checker uh, to, to be used, and, and runs that one. Then this one, I mean, if you apply to, this, to the other half of the, of the input data, then this wins the competition, okay? Although you're not really doing anything, just like 
trying to figure out what is matching uh, which benchmark. OK. Uh, two summary slides. Uh, so what we have seen is uh, using learning for verification as a sort of heuristic to help us enhance the verification. So we have our verification objectives and we have troubles. And uh, we use learning to, uh, to get rid of the troubles, so to improve scalability, to improve explainability of the results, which is something that is like a, a huge thing for verification, but no one really knew how to address that and people were largely ignoring it, but I mean, that's one of the hurdles. Uh, that prevents uh, verification from being accepted by pra more practically oriented people because they are not making sense out of the results and, uh, and uh, of course, scalability for, for practical large systems uh, this is also, also important. So one of the examples was how to speed up things using reinforcement learning uh, and the general idea was try to identify what is the important parts of the state space and there do the computation. In the other one, when we uh, try to create small and readable strategies, we use decision tree learning, but for the same meta goal, try to identify what are the important parts that you should represent. And there we use the, yeah, there we do the decision trees. So it's always about this communication between the two. And uh, I mean, in the first case, when we had this uh, value iteration over here and the reinforcement over here, Value iteration is slow. Uh, I mean, it's maybe, well, it's, not, it's uh, not giving you entirely correct results in the default form, so you have to have these upper bounds and lower bounds. Then it's correct, but then it's, it's slow. Uh, reinforcement learning is not guaranteed to give you uh, like the, the, the current error. Uh, usually it, it, it converges, uh, but um, you, you don't know how fast and you don't really know about the results. And actually, oh, and that's what, I mean, I'm not, actually a reinforcement learning person, but uh, what the reinforcement learning people told me is, well, it's actually also quite slow. But if you put them together in the new setup, where, I mean, you have the model, this is something that this guy didn't have, and to this guy, you get the, the information from this one, and you return the information back, then you actually get something that is guaranteed to work and is much faster. So it can give you more than, uh, more than just a uh, you know, pure sum of the two. And uh, lastly, to, to uh, actually thinking about what, is, uh, what are we doing here? I mean, uh, I said at some point of time, uh, oh, this is a paper where they return a safe controller, but it may not be the cheapest one. Then um, it's always the question of your particular application do I need hard guarantees for this or not? Do I want to pay for this? Uh, how much do we want to compromise uh, between say, scalability and, and correctness? How much of it is still verification, one question. How much of it is useful for your particular application this is more, more important. And the uh, question is maybe, do we have to compromise at all? Well, I mean, for, in some cases we didn't have to. I mean, uh, the invariant generation, for instance, uh, it's, it's, you, I mean, the result is correct, right? I mean, uh, and the, with, with the strategy representation of the BRTDP, we knew how far off we are. Okay, so is Epsilon optimal controller good enough for your problem? Uh, if, so knowing this Epsilon, is it, is it uh, I mean, how far you are from the optimum? Is it important for you or not? Uh, are you fine with arbitrary controllers? I mean, is the, is the AlphaGo good enough? Well, it depends on your application, right? I mean, if you... Uh, you wouldn't bet your life on AlphaGo winning a, a match, but I mean, it's good for fun, right, watching it. So uh, uh, it really depends on the application. And uh, so, I mean, from the verification perspective, uh, I try to take the approach to present the parts that are mostly focusing on not sacrificing guarantees. So it's still verification, but you're still improving your scalability and, uh, and, and usability. And this kind of usage of learning as an oracle to give you hints, suggestions, advices that you take and then you process them your own old-fashioned way, this seems to be safe and uh, definitely enough. Uh, maybe in some cases 
probably approximately correct uh, results are totally fine because anyway, and that was the question, where do the probabilities come from? Well, it's just experience anyway, so you're not sure. It's just, again, probably approximately correct all the way from the start maybe. Or so then um, one should always uh, bear in mind and, uh, what, what, your, what your application area is. And uh, yeah, so I mean, I do definitely don't want to, uh, don't want to uh, use learning to uh, create strategies uh, that drive our cars, although I mean, it's, it's a very hot topic on this uh, machine learning uh, uh, end of spectrum. Uh, but I hopefully I advocated that, I mean, the use of, of uh, learning and, and verification is, is still a pretty cool topic uh, as well. So uh, you, can, uh, you can use verification uh, with the help of learning in a safe way. For those of you who are interested in this topic a bit more, uh, there have been already two, uh, two uh, issues of this event, uh, learning and verification, which is a workshop uh, where you're all cordially invited. It takes place uh, together with ETAPS, which most of you probably know. Uh, so uh, many people are coming and uh, from a from, uh, broad verification area. And, uh, and uh, yeah, this, this uh, year we had uh, also quite a few uh, nice invited talks. And uh, next, uh, next year it's going to happen in, in Prague. So if you like uh, old-fashioned cities like this one, then I mean, Prague is uh, probably uh, the, the, the one to be chosen in, in, in Europe, or at least in Central Europe. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention, and I'm ready to take questions. Thank you. So let me repeat the question. This question is uh, asking, uh, our models are often compositional, so it's composed of, uh, MDPs are composed of many components. How does this help me to understand the interaction of the components? So, uh, for instance, one of the things that you can do is when you look at the tree, then uh, the behavior may depend on some third component, but if you want to kind of ignore this for a moment, you can kind of ignore this node and get a subtree that is actually not capturing all the information, but it's capturing the relevant information concerning the components that you're interested in. So you keep the variables that are appearing in those relevant modules and the actions that are uh, relevant to their communication, and this gives you a subtree for that particular uh, sub Com composition. Totally. So, I mean, if you have uh, if you have a spaghetti thing at the beginning that no one understands, uh, your chances of recovering uh, the deep information down there are lower. Uh, so then, uh, still, maybe there is a chance that you actually discover something that no one sees in the messy thing because I mean you have the computational power. Uh, but of course, the more structured problem and the more structured system you have at the beginning, the more structure you can expect on the output. Uh, so in that uh, perspective, of course, it's not a silver bullet that uh, from now on we don't have to do any annotations in the code because we can all synthesize the meaning out of just the pure code. Uh, rather, the trend is to actually take annotations as part of the code and learn also from that because, I mean, the, the naming of the variables, for instance, this is something that is, from the verification perspective, it's totally irrelevant. It's X and Y. And what are the namings of the variables? I mean, it's like long strings des describing that something already happened and maybe you're still, I mean, someone else is doing the same thing. And then it's obvious that these two variables should have some sort of communication. There will be some relationship between the two. So you could, uh, you could be in interested more in predicates relating these two rather than this one and, and something in a completely different part of the system. Right? So then this is uh, partially happening. I mean, the, the, there, is, there is work, uh, my Microsoft say, uh, who are, who are uh, looking a lot at uh, what the names of the variables are, how does this affect their usage, and, uh, and deducing things from, from that. Uh, so this is, uh, again, once again, very important that you have this safety envelope that even if you think like, oh, this one and that one could have something in common, even if they don't, it's not, you're not in hazard, right? I mean, it's, you're not risking anything. So, yes, this, is, this would be a desirable enhancement for, for, for these systems. Well, so, okay, so speaking about space shuttles, okay, so if you want, uh, so you cannot really verify a space shuttle, 
Well, what we can definitely do is, for instance, the following, and, and this has been happening. Uh, so you have these, uh, I mean, you have satellites running around the orbit, and then uh, basically what they have to do is they have to change the position of uh, of the what is this thing called? I mean, the, the stuff that catches the, the 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 rays of the sun to get the energy. Okay, so the the, the solar panels basically. I mean, it's, the different, yeah, it's the basically solar panels. Now they have to rotate in, the, in some way, and then depending on how much energy you get, then you can perform this task or that task, then you are on the other side of the planet, you don't get any energy, you still want to perform some tasks, but you don't want to run out of the energy too much, so you have to make sure that you're not getting into the dangerous region, but still you want to do as much as possible. So this kind of stuff, uh, like verifying that if your battery model is like this, and I mean, you have done the measurements that, I mean, the parameters kind of fit and you have the model of the battery and then you have the model of how much uh, this kind of censoring and how much sending this message is, is costly and then you have all this information, you have a big model, then you build a safe system that doesn't run out of battery and tries to optimize how much you perform per minute on average, how many, how many tasks or um, you have kind of prioritize the task and all that. So this is something you can easily do. Uh, and then this just is the scheduling of the activity there and, and uh, checking the, verifying basically the battery. And then, I mean, maybe you can uh, ask a different question like, uh, well, something else doesn't break there, so you can uh, design a, a fault tree for uh, the, the components that are in there and analyze that one. So, I mean, it's, it's never like that, okay, this is my space shuttle and the question is, is it safe? And you push a button and the answer is yes. Uh, it's definitely like you specify the particular problems and typically you try to look at a certain domain. So, I mean, just the scheduling and you kind of ignore that there could be actually a meteorite flying next to, to your satellite and uh, ripping away one of, the, one of the solar panels and now you have less, less energy or whatever. You ignore all that, right? And you analyze it somewhere else. So, uh, yeah, you have to decompose your problem, you have to decompose your property, and then uh, you, you, you try to, to verify as much as you can. But certainly it's, it's, it's hard and, and we need help uh, in terms of scalability as well as, as, as usability. That is the whole point.